If you want to raise a great crop of alfalfa, there are many things you can do. We already talked about lime today. That's probably one of the most important things. You want that soil pH above 6.5 if you're going to have a great alfalfa crop. If it's below 6.5, you are giving up major tonnage. Get that fixed first. Then we look at the fertility requirements of that soil. And if you go to the Ag PhD Fertilizer Removal app, you can see exactly what's in a ton of alfalfa. It's a lot of nutrients. So when you think about it, if you're going to harvest a really good crop, for a few years in a row off that ground, there's a lot of fertility you got to put back in that ground. Now there are several different strategies that we'll see. One may be just really building that soil up before you put the alfalfa in, and another may be spoon feeding as you go. All right, well here's the reason why spoon feeding doesn't work very well, because you're going to spoon feed phosphorus and especially potassium. Those are the two big nutrients that come off in an alfalfa crop. Well, phosphorus doesn't move in soil hardly at all, and potassium isn't much better. So my point is, if you say, oh, I'm just going to go broadcast some P and K after I take my first cutting every year, yeah, good luck with that. Your P and K are only going to move down a quarter of an inch, a half an inch into the soil. Well, how many of your alfalfa roots are in that top quarter or half inch? And also, how many of those nutrients get into the plant when that top inch of soil dries out every year? You can get by with less fertilizer is what we're trying to tell you here if you start before you ever even put in your crop by using higher rates of P and K down into the soil. So P and K don't move down through the soil very well, but other nutrients do. Sulfur, that's one that can move through the soil yep. fairly well. With micronutrients, we can do those in-between cutting type of applications with low doses of micros if we need to address certain things. Uh, but many times we're going to be broadcasting those out either in the spring or in the fall and, and trying to cover what our micronutrient needs are. Well, when you talk about micros, the first one that comes to mind for everyone in alfalfa production is what? Boron. But here's the problem. Boron can be toxic if you get too much on, so you have to be really careful about how you apply it. So let's say you get that low pH, low calcium situation. Not only are you guaranteed to have worse alfalfa production, you're guaranteed to have more issue with boron toxicity. So get the calcium up, get your pH up, and now you can put on low doses of boron and get a lot better alfalfa. One other thing that we see a lot is, is guys that have livestock and manure. In many areas where alfalfa is being grown, there's livestock right there because we want to try and minimize the trucking from the alfalfa to ultimately the livestock it's going to be fed to. If you're putting the manure back out on these acres, that's a great place to put it. Uh, I talked to many hog producers around the country who have you know, really a lot of P and K in their hog manure and, and they're saying, wow, I'm worried with my manure management program, uh, how I'm going to do this, I, I need to acquire more acres to be able to spread manure over, or they could use a crop that's a high nutrient user like alfalfa. So I see guys raising alfalfa in hog manure areas where they can put the manure on and have a crop that can extract that P and K out of the ground relatively quickly. Over the last few years, we've seen a lot of farmers using fungicide in wheat, in corn, in soybeans, in sunflowers. Very, very popular there. We haven't seen a real big trend to alfalfa yet, but that is now starting to change as these fungicide prices are coming down. Where we're seeing the best success is especially around that first cutting, maybe a week or two before first cutting, just check the label and what the pre-harvest interval is, and then maybe the last cutting of the season or even after the last cutting so you get better winter survivability. Well, the other thing is if you can hold those leaves all the way to the bottom of the plant, that's tremendous for tonnage and possibly for quality as well. Many times we're seeing alfalfa being harvested and yeah, we're green up towards the top of the plant, but we've got yellow leaves at the bottom and most of the time they end up falling off as we're trying to harvest it. So if you want to avoid some of that, just try some fungicide out there. And if you're not sure about this, hey, the cool thing with alfalfa is you have three or four cuttings and you can try stuff out. All right, I'll try this on this cutting and hey, if it worked and I got more tonnage, I get to do it again and again and again and get more tonnage throughout the season on every cutting. Fungicide prices are finally coming down, so that's great news, but we've seen insecticide prices already come way down in the last 5-10 years. So now you can go out with a full rate of a pyrethroid to kill things like leaf hoppers or maybe some alfalfa weevil larvae early in the season. Two bucks an acre, that's all you're going to invest. Now we don't suggest you spray insecticide without seeing any bugs. Just scout your field on a regular basis, especially right after every cutting. If you see any bugs, get them sprayed right away. Pyrethroids are dirt cheap. 
All right, and if you follow all those fertility recommendations and have a great thick stand of alfalfa, you probably won't have too many weed problems, but if you do have some weeds out there, there are some weed control options that you should consider. Now, Bucktroll is one of those products that can be used. It's good on a number of weeds, like lamb's quarters, for example, and it doesn't do too bad on pennycrest. So those are a couple of primary weeds, and the mustard weeds, you can do okay if you get out there early before those weeds get huge. You can also spike in an ounce or two of butyrac. That does get a little hard. It's 2,4-DB, but you could throw a little bit of that in with your Bucktroll. Otherwise, about the only other good option is Pursuit for many of the broadleaf weeds. For grass, we got a lot of different grass killers that are very inexpensive, two, three bucks an acre. So that's not going to cost you much. And I would encourage you, when you're putting your stand in, use a half a gallon of Eptam. That's been our best way of getting a lot of those weeds under control right off the bat. Now, some people talk about or ask the question, how do I kill dandelions in alfalfa? Well, you don't unless you've got Roundup. Some people are trying things like Velpar or Metribuzin when the alfalfa is dormant. Look, if you've got that big a problem with dandelions, it's time to rip up your stand and start over. Well, there are a lot of things you can do in alfalfa production to improve your yields, improve your tonnage, and the life of your stand. Take advantage of these weed control, fertility, disease control, and insect control options that are available to you. Well, when we talk about weed control options, we've got lots of them for our Weed of the Week. It's coming up later in the show.